Hello, my name is Derek Atkins, and this video lecture is entitled Business Ethics. This video lecture is for the Church, Society, and Ethical Issues in Asia course at the East Asia School of Theology. The marketplace affects all of us, whether we are consumers, business people, or employees in various companies. As we take part in the marketplace, the question arises, how can we honor Christ in the marketplace? What kind of ethics should guide us as we navigate different issues in the marketplace? This video lecture will explore the question of business ethics. We will begin by answering the question, why is business ethics important? Next, we'll look at some biblical teachings that relate to business ethics. Then we'll look at some foundational issues that we should consider as we navigate different issues in business ethics. That will be followed by um, a more detailed look at different specific issues that arise in the field of business ethics. We will then round off our discussion about business ethics by looking at how Christians can respond to corruption. So let's begin with this question. Why is business ethics important? Business people make many choices each day at work that affect themselves and many others, including their families, their business partners, the outside community, and even the environment. Therefore, it is important for business people and the businesses they run to make wise decisions that will benefit not only themselves, but many others as well. Growing numbers of people now argue that ethical business practices should be done not simply because they're the right thing to do, but also because they're increasingly becoming the profitable thing to do. For example, bad customer reviews on websites such as Yelp can adversely affect a business's profitability. Nielsen research shows that 55% of global online shoppers in 60 nations are particularly passionate about companies that are perceived to take a positive social and environmental impact. And for example, some customers are willing to pay more for fair trade products because they wish to buy products that have been created in morally commendable ways. So we have both the negative impact of bad customer reviews and also the more positive um, interact the more positive uh, push by customers who are willing to pay more to buy products by companies that they believe are doing the ethical thing. On the other hand, when businesses engage in unethical practices, they often end up losing far more money than they would have otherwise. For example, um, a number of years ago, Volkswagen had data showing that its diesel engine emissions exceeded U.S. pollution standards. However, instead of redesigning the engine, which would have been expensive, Volkswagen, Volkswagen engineers installed a unit in each car 
to interpret the emissions as meeting the Environmental Protection Agency standards. When this fraud was discovered, Volkswagen was forced to buy back millions of cars and several employees were sentenced to jail. Combined with massive fines, Volkswagen ended up paying more than $30 billion, a fraction of what they would have spent if they had gone ahead and done the right thing by redesigning their diesel engine. So this helps us to understand why business ethics is important. Now, let's look at what the Bible says about work and business. The very first person whom we see working in the Bible is God himself. We see God at work during creation, bringing the universe into existence, creating light, separating land and water, creating stars, moons, and planets, creating plants, animals, and finally humans. And then in Genesis 2-2, we read, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. We see two important things here. First, the fact that God himself worked to create the universe means that work is a noble and dignified activity. Second, we see that God himself demonstrated the importance of resting from work. So we see that work is actually a good thing. We also see the importance of resting from work which includes the practice of a daily, of a weekly Sabbath. Next, we see God giving Adam and Eve a mandate to rule over his creation. This mandate is found in Genesis 1.28, which says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Here we see that God gave us work, the work of ruling over his creation. In our lesson on creation care, we saw that Part of this work of ruling over God's creation is a responsibility to care for his creation as his representative. Here, I want to point out two things. Number one, work is one of God's good gifts to us. This is quite different from the idea that many people today have about work as being difficult, boring, or meaningless. For many today, work is, at best, a necessary evil, something we must do to earn our daily bread. But God gave us work as a good gift. The second thing I want to point out is that God gave us the gift of work before the fall. This is another reason why work is a good thing. Work was originally given to us as activity that would glorify God and benefit all of creation, including humanity. This is important because we need to understand that work is not a punishment for the fall. Unfortunately, the nature of work was radically changed by the fall. After Adam and Eve disobeyed God, God pronounced a curse on work in Genesis 3.19, which says, By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food 
until you return to the ground. Work was no longer what God originally made it. Before the fall, work was not a toilsome thing, but now work is often characterized by boring, repetitive tasks, demeaning labor, for example, slaves in ancient times or low-paying jobs today. Work is also often characterized by tiresome labor, such as the labor that is done by farmers which is very tiring work. Work is also characterized by, sometimes characterized by dangerous assignment. For example, in some factories, the working conditions are quite dangerous. Even if safety precautions are taken, the work can still be quite dangerous and employees can still be um, injured or even killed while on the job. Work today is also um, sometimes characterized by dirty tasks, tasks that cause us to become physically dirty. For example, the work of an auto mechanic um, a mecha or the work of coal miners. You can think of other jobs that make people physically dirty because the work is in fact dirty. Sin also affects many of the relationships we have work, at work. And this is why there's always some kind of office politics going on, even in the best workplaces. In addition, work has been corrupted by many sinful practices, such as lying, stealing, wrong sexual relationships, covetousness, and, and, and in some extreme cases, even murder. Sin also affects the attitudes that people have toward their jobs. Now, these attitudes can go in two opposite directions. On the one hand, some people respond to the difficulties of work by trying to do as little work as possible. They often do only the bare minimum required. Instead of focusing on their work, they focus on pleasure and they live for the weekend. And this can be seen by the uh, quote on the left side of this screen. The first five days after the weekend are always the hardest. So this represents this represents those who live for the weekend, but others respond in just the opposite direction, and they respond to the reality of work by working hard. In fact, some people will work too hard. They'll focus on earning as much money as they can, or they may become super competitive and trying to become the top producer in their department, or they may become workaholics. These people often end up sacrificing their families, their personal lives, and sometimes even their health. For these people, work has become their idol because their work has taken the place of God. Fortunately, the Bible story about work doesn't end with the fall because God has been at work throughout history to redeem humanity. Because of God's redemptive activity, we can now join with God in his redemptive work. The Bible gives us examples of men and women through whose work God has been able to work out his redemptive purposes. These people included Joseph, who worked as a slave, yet God raised him to become second only to Pharaoh in Egypt. And he was used, jo Joseph was used by God to save Egypt, many surrounding nations, and even his own family. 
There's also the example of King Josiah, who served faithfully as king of Judah, and he was used by God to lead his nation back to faithful obedience to God. So when the, uh, the book of the law was discovered while the temple was being renovated, Josiah responded positively and was used by God to lead the Israelites back to the proper worship of God. There's also the example of Daniel, who faithfully served several kings. Then there's the example of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion of good character. And God honored him by allowing him to become the first Gentile convert to Christianity. And we also have the example of Lydia, who was a wealthy businesswoman who helped the Apostle Paul in spreading the gospel in Philippi. She um, is often known as the first Christian convert in Europe. And she also helped the Apostle Paul in spreading the gospel throughout Philippi and the surrounding area. The Bible also gives us considerable teachings about work. For example, the book of Proverbs provides much instruction about work. So we have these um, verses from Proverbs that speak about work. He who gathers crops in summer is a wise son. That's Proverbs 10, 5a. Proverbs 12, 11a says, he who works his land will have abundant food. Proverbs 13, 11b says, he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. This is found in Proverbs 14, 23. And then Proverbs 22, 29 says, do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before king. He will not serve before obscure men. Paul also writes about work. One of his most familiar passages on work is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, which we see here on this slide. Let me offer a number of observations about this passage. The first observation I want to make is that this passage is part of a larger section known as the household passage, in which Paul describes how different relationships in the home should be carried out. During Roman times, slaves and servants were considered part of their owner's household, which is why this passage focuses on the relationship between slaves and masters. The second thing I want to point out is that in this passage, Paul is not, I repeat, not giving approval to slavery. Slavery existed long before Paul wrote these words. So in this passage, Paul is addressing what was then a present reality. In fact, it has been estimated that up to 20% of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves, with that number rising to 30% in Italy. However, Paul's command for owners to treat their slaves with dignity was radical for his day, because under Roman law, masters could treat their slaves however they wanted, including abusing them and even killing them. A third point I want to make is that many preachers have drawn principles for work from this passage, but we should be cautious in doing so because most believers today are not slaves, nor are they slave owners. Nevertheless, 
we can still find several broad principles in this passage. First, employees should obey their supervisors with respect and with sincerity of heart, just as they would Christ. Second, employees should serve their supervisors wholeheartedly as if they were serving the Lord and not men. Third, employers are to treat their employees with respect. And finally, employers should not display favoritism among their employees. Now that we've considered some of the Bible's teachings concerning work, let's go to part two and consider business ethics from a Christian perspective. <laughs>